Okay, so today for the last topic in this series on the local and regional level, the urban and spatial planning. And we, I've repeated here the three basic parts where you find this in the T books. Um, yeah, so, sorry. Should be used to this by now, but there we go. After this lecture, I hope you will have understood how urban and spatial planning can integrate ecosystem services, an idea on how policy design can make use of ecosystem service concept and incorporate values, and an overview of useful approaches and tools. And a point that, yeah, I've been trying to make over the whole series, but would like to again reinforce that monetary values are but an input in a wider decision-making process. So very briefly, objectives of urban planning, well, obviously to provide public services and infrastructure, to enhance citizens' quality of life, and to foster economic growth. What do ecosystem services have to do with this? Well, if you look at these different topic areas, it's, for most of them, it's pretty evident. Regarding ecosystem services and environmental issues, what can local administrations, what can urban managers actually do? Well, they can act as a role model in the sense of managing municipal resources in an ecosystem service conscious way. They can promote and set incentives for others to act in such a way, and they can regulate, thus obligating others to take certain aspects into account. You find in chapter four, table 4.1, a whole set of different options, ideas that are pertinent to the, to the urban context, how this can be approached from, from different angles and concerning different services. Now, the relationship is most obvious if we look at water, fresh water provisioning. We saw that one third of the world's cities depend, at least for part of their drink, drinking water, on protected areas. Wastewater treatment, another obvious example. So this is the Uganda by, uh, example that you've gone in. I'm just one third of the world's biggest cities, so we're not talking all cities. Coastal protection and flood protection. So these, these are the areas where it's most obvious. You see a strong um, consciousness on these issues. You have the whole debate on green infrastructure here in the States. We have a, which is basically about water management as I understood. We have a similar debate on green infrastructure in Europe, which is slightly more towards connectivity and habitats and replacing gray infrastructure. But these are the entry points where this is obviously entering. Now, what I want to focus on is a little bit more the process. And I want to use two examples. One is here from the United States, from Napa Valley, where they've had an incredible amount of floods and it's a city of 70,000. Over the last 150 years, they've, they've had something like 50 to 70 flood events, so every two to three years something happens there. And after another big flooding event in 1986, finally there, it was a whole movement that emerged opposing the, the plan of the American Corps of Engineers to build even more culverts and, and uh, dredge the, 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 the river more but rather to approach this in a more comprehensive way, and they founded the so-called Living River Initiative. This is a very, very broad movement involving 25 agencies and plenty of individuals from all kinds of different directions and, and expertise, and jointly they've come up with a plan for integrated river management to prevent damage by flooding, and the 400 million dollars that this costs are divided 50% from the local and other 50% comes from the national level through the Corps of Engineers. And 
the 50% that needed to be raised locally, there was a decision to increase the local sales tax by 1% over the next 20 years in order to cover this cost. So if in this country someone agrees to raise taxes, they must really care about the issue. Now, the plan envisaged to enhance several ecosystem services, so not only address the flooding issue, but also recreation, tourism. It actually involved, as you might be able to kind of see from the, from the picture, opening up the floodbed and allowing marshes and wetlands on either side of the river, which imply taking down some properties and, and buying out some of the people. Um, but it has led to, to a big reconstruction in the areas that were formerly um, in risk of flooding. It has led to approximately $400 million private investment of rebuilding hotels and, and, and business and residences. And it has created recreation areas in the center of the city and made the whole center of the city much more attractive. So property values increased substantially, and insurance rates were actually reduced. They, there's an estimate that I think 3,000 properties will have lower or no flood insurance as soon as the, the project is, is finished. So if you're in such a quote-unquote lucky situation that the pressure is high enough, you can have a broad coalition of different interests actually getting together and, and implementing these things. Next, I'd like to talk about the, a study in Cape Town. And now in Cape Town, the mainstreaming was much more of a challenge in the sense that there was not a broad understanding and, and, and movement to actually foster and take into account ecosystem services. And this story is, the, is, a, and yeah, this story is about the Environmental Administration Commissioning a Study. And we'll look, through, we'll look at it through the lens of the TEAP six steps that we introduced in the first lecture and have been applying to several of the case studies. So first step is to specify the policy and management issues. And they actually did, they didn't follow this approach, but they actually did this step because the approach wasn't there yet when they did this whole thing. And so as I said, the Environmental Management Department commissioned this study, but b before they handed it over to the consultants, and, and the, the purpose, the objective was to make an economic case for increased spending, city spending on natural asset management. So a clear objective for which to produce the values. Now before the study commenced, before they commissioned the consultant, they engaged with all other departments within the city management that had some impact on or some management of natural resources and with the financial department. And they've involved them throughout the process and this has been crucial. So second step, identify and prioritize ecosystem services. Well, they did that as a participatory process with these different line managers using one-to-one -one interviews as well as facilitated sessions. They had five criteria for selecting the relative importance of the ecosystem services, an, an impact matrix basically addressing who benefits from these services. This partially covers TEEP step six. The link to economic development, the possibility of the city to actually influence these services and a system of risk ranking, so which of these services are in danger and can be, can be helped. Step three, defining information needs. So did they decided to value prioritized services by a combination of primary valuation techniques and some benefit transfer estimates. They were in the lucky position to have data for the city for former years for some of the areas. And again, involving the line managers and especially the finance department was key to focusing on actual information needs. So what was the message? What is the wording? What are the terms? What are the assumptions that these people have to, 
take up this information and make it useful. Step four, assessing the actual values. So here we have a couple of, in this case, values in rand rather than in dollars, and the methods being used. What, what is not so clear in the study, and I tried understanding the, the chapter last night, is on water purification and waste, waste treatment. The only estimates that, they, that I found there were cleanup costs to recover certain uh, water purification functions of some of their yeah, pond or lake structures. What I found interesting is this uh, sixth ecosystem services that was prioritized, the aesthetics and sense of place related values. And here they used a whole combination of arguments and you'll see the first two are entirely qualitative. Combined then, so evidence of the importance of, of green spaces for health, as well as to attract skilled entrepreneurs that are of course important for the economic development. Then Cape Town has an in, important part of film and advertising industry, and there they did a direct estimate of the natural asset um, related components and values. And they had a couple of, of examples where they could illustrate influence on property values and and uh, influence of rehabilitation, restoration uh, projects, for example, of some of the rivers in the, in the city that had influenced property values significantly. Now, values as such are not enough to make the business case. So what they agreed on calculating are these two ratios. One is basically a benefit-cost ratio between the investments and the expected increase in gross geographic product, so not looking at national but rather at regional um, product, which were 1.2 to 2 times higher than for the overall investments by the city, and a so-called unit reference value where they calculated what expenditure is necessary, the level of the city to create a rand's worth of benefits, and this was 16 percent as compared to, for example, water infrastructure, where it takes much more investment. Now, coming back to this as a process, what was, what was important? Important was there was a clear objective, in this case to make a business case. They consulted with the relevant people outside the environmental uh, sector. It was a participatory process of prioritizing the relevant ecosystem services. There was a strong focus in the whole argumentation on human benefits, not only in the sense of, yes, we need clean water, but also the importance to attract skilled labor, for example, which is something that talked to people of the Economic Development Department. However, in view of competing demands, and this came at a very bad moment because they had just finished the stadium, re rehabilitating the stadium for the World Soccer Championship, and that was, of course, with considerable overspending. There was not much flexibility in, in actually moving budget to, towards more investment in, in environmental fields. Nonetheless, the, the environmental department concluded that it was a fantastic foundation for further development of environmental fiscal reform strategies. They considered the process was as important as the outcome in terms of a study and were quite aware that this might not immediately lead to, to, to change in budgeting, but there was then a plan by these different by these different line managers and departments to jointly search for new financing sources for different initiatives. And it has created a lot of understanding and, and uh, common ground within the city administration. So, any questions on this? Pavan? I, I want to tell the, did people work out to what extent this kind of planning actually helped conserve the biodiversity of the planet? The biodiversity of? The plateau behind, I forget the name of the plateau behind. The it. Table Mountain? Yeah. Well, I, I think that part is quite well protected. 
in, in, in this moment, and there is a, a certain level of awareness. It has the botanical garden, one of the most famous ones in the world, etc. But I think it, it helped tremendously, especially for all these, uh, yeah, water. They had they had very deteriorated rivers and and lakes. And when I was there at the Eclay conference in in March, we had an excursion to one of these lakes that is referred to as as a problem in in the study. And definitely something has happened there in the meantime. So I think it was more this awareness creation that rivers aren't just waste dumps and that they actually pre uh, pre um, present services. And they have, the, South Africa has its Working for Water program where they've had a tremendous amount of public investment into recovering water bodies, which has also helped, but that has come in from the national level. Right. But it, 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 it appears that for the specific evaluation of the outcomes is not being done, but it seems that would be a quite a powerful statement if it were done, because you clearly have the right approach and the right inputs into the process, but you're not measuring the outcomes. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not aware of any study looking into what has actually happened in the meantime. I think this is a 2007 or 8 study, and um, I know that the, the city has invested in some parts. I don't know how much of the city budget went in there or if they were available to attract outside funding, which might well be the, car, the, the case for this ecological park I was referring to just now. If you're interested in the details, they are too. The, the reports are just as long as, it, as these URLs uh, make you think. Actually, the one on the methodology is quite concise, but the, the final report is very, very detailed. OK, from, from there, I'd like to talk about an approach that's called EcoBudget. It's an accounting system for municipal environmental management has been developed by ICLE, International Council of Local Governments, for more sustainable uh, management and has been applied by several of them. It allows to plan, control, monitor, report on, on and evaluate consumption of natural resources as well as certain service functions. You see here some ecosystem services, noise is probably not directly an ecosystem services but a related environmental issue. The idea is to keep spending of these resources within a master budget. So important part of the process is to identify environmental targets. Then um, it sets up this accounting system and measures the achievement against these targets to see how successful it has been. It complements the traditional budgeting accounting system. So it's another component that uh, municipalities can add on to their systems by an, uh, this is an environmental component, you usually have the spending and, and, and human resources and, and finance, etc. But most municipalities don't look into their environmental budget and it uses physical units, which makes it easier in most cases to set up the system. It allows for for participation, and there are several examples in, in, the, in chapter four, you'll find an example from, from the Philippines where they started measuring, okay, how much mangroves, how much trees, how much uh, open spaces do we have, and, and realized the importance of these for tourism, for waste management, for, for fisheries and, and actual poverty alley, uh, reduction programs. So they started with a much more conscious management of these and were able to achieve most of their objectives over the last couple of years. It has another example from Sweden where the target setting was mainly towards energy independence, becoming independent of fossil fuel energy. And this is a very forest dominated municipality where again this kind of target setting and accounting has helped to achieve these goals over a couple of years. So, next, moving on to spatial planning, and just as an introduction, spatial planning, what is the objective? Well, an orientation to where different land use options should take place. It varies tremendously depending on where you are. 
Here in the States, it's mainly at municipal level, but you'll have totally different systems from one state to the next, probably also from one municipality to the next. There are countries that have very hierarchic systems of, of nested planning, like Germany, for example, where you have, you have certain orientations from the national level and you have a master plan that is already binding towards certain uses and then municipalities can, within this, these margins, they can do their, their planning. What is, what is also interesting is that some countries have it in the sense of developing development policy, so it's the formulation of objectives and goals towards which they want to, to move, which is more yeah, trying to appeal to people that move in this direction, whereas in many other countries it's actually legally binding. So in Germany, if you construct something outside a construction area, you, you have you have a serious problem, with, whereas this is not the case in, in all countries. Yeah. An important instrument are our master plans that usually come up with some kind of consecutive um, sequenced actions that might be necessary to, in the long term, achieve certain goals. An important instrument that is used almost worldwide is environmental impact assessment and it follows basically the same steps all over so beginning with a screening to determine which proposals are actually subject to to impact assessment and there are some very interesting cases of for example the UK passed passed legislation or not, not even legislation but required certain fishing operations to do environmental impact assessment which immediately led to a different way of approaching this and looking at certain ecosystem services affected which they usually don't do in their in their management so it varies tremendously what is or not um, subject to EIA scoping so the identification of which impacts are, you, are we actually going to be looking at that will then be, be put into the terms of reference. And it's these two steps where including ecosystem services um, is most important or where it makes most sense. Some ecosystem services will always be included in some way, but many, in many places and, and situations, it's not a comprehensive inclusion. So this is where there's po potential for improvement. And then it goes on with the assessment study as such, which comes up with an environmental management plan, a review, which is usually with some kind of public involvement where obviously there's another opportunity to, to call for accounting for, for ecosystem services, the decision making and then the follow up, where again, if ecosystem services are included in the monitoring, we are already a, a huge step ahead. So this, as one powerful instrument where local municipalities can, by influencing the terms of reference, make sure that certain services are included. Now this is another example from South Africa to illustrate um, a planning framework for, for um, different parts of, of a municipality. Um, a municipality characterized again by high unemployment, by a large proportion of the population depending directly on ecosystem services to sustain livelihoods, especially water but also, also food. And what they did was a strategic catchment assessment, so they subdivided this into eight different units and, and came up with indicators on the state or condition of certain services in these units, indicators on the pressures that, that uh, affect these, these services and the responses that are already in place for 11 different, they call it themes, but basically it's, it's ecosystem services. They also did a value estimate of overall values of, of services, but I think in terms of planning, um, in terms of planning the indicators and the indications of what could possibly be done have been, have been more decisive. 
So what did they do? Basically, they balanced between supply and demand assessed in each of the catchment units and then color coded according to the balance of this, which the, these are the ecosystem services taken into account and then the different situations, two of the areas being in critical condition, one being in quite good condition and the other somewhere in between. And you see these little icons symbolizing the, the state of the different of the different, for the different services. Each of this has underlying some indicators. Uh, Carvita has put up the, the entire document on the, on, on the classes system, so you can have a look at, it's a very easily understandable, colorful, graphical uh, way of conveying importance to people who usually don't think in these terms. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not, this is, a, this is a study done, commissioned to a group of, of people who have been trying to highlight here what are the development potentials, what are the areas, and what are the services in the areas that might be crucial. And they, they in fact, I think that comes here, they establish different planning zones, so determining in these zones it would be good to, to focus on con conservation then some open space or linkage zones and some development zones in order to orient where things would need to happen. But they don't, and, and they make some proposals as to policy responses that, uh, that um, could possibly be helpful, uh, taking into account, is it the municipality's um, decision or do they need to link up with the district or, and things like that. So they give some indications on this management, but it's not an overall development plan in the sense of, okay, how can we attract uh, investment from somewhere else to really start moving things uh, quickly. It's an area characterized by, by huge population uh, increase. They have a population increase of 8%. Per year, so a lot of people migrating into this area and kind of trying to. They have a harbor to, to get employment opportunities there, and but kind of camping out in the open spaces and and, and squatting, etc. Because and and employment opportunities are just not uh, nearly equivalent to what to the inflow of people. Now, South Africa in general has very, very high unemployment rates, so this is not a particular hotspot, but uh, it's attractive enough to still, to still get a lot of people in there. And this is, this is a way of trying to at least conserve the, the most crucial bits of, of ecological infrastructure, if you will, um, to, to maintain the system functioning and not to put another burden onto the whole, uh, to the whole thing in the sense of having then to uh, struggle for water and, and things like that as well. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of a background to manage these, but not a development plan as such. Okay, so this is a comparatively I mean, it's, it's quite broad in the sense that they looked into, into many different indicators and services, but they tried to communicate on a very basic, you know, this color coding idea and a, a very basic uh, level in order to get attention and, and outline possible avenues. Okay, so this is an example from Indonesia where they had, uh, I mean, this is also, I'd say, a global trend. When I first started working in Latin America 20 years ago, hardly any of the countries had spatial planning established, and then there was a huge wave of ordenamiento territorial in practically the entire continent, and a lot of yeah, people studying this and getting into this. And in Indonesia, it's even more recent, uh, in 2007, that a new spatial planning law was actually allowing um, or with actually opening up room for policy to, to influence there and also taking it down to the district levels. So allowing for much more location specific planning. And so this new law opened possibilities and in this area an NGO forum um, organized a visioning process so that they came up with different options um, yeah, analyzing the, the situation. 
and this is characterized by intense logging and forest conversion to, to plantations, which affect, of course, biodiversity, but also water regulation, erosion, similar to the situations we, we saw last time in the Lusa National Park. Um, they got support from, from the Natural Capital Project, which is a collaboration between academic institutions here, so mainly Stanford, um, and, and different environmental NGOs, and they've put up this INVEST tool, which is a tool for mapping and analyzing services, and it's all available on the web, and you can enter your own data there, and according to the level of detail of data that you have, the, you can use different modules, and it goes all the way up to valuation as well, if you have the necessary data to, to provide for this. Um, so what it basically does is produce different maps. Here you have one for, for water yield capacity of, of the area, but they produce different maps and overlay these. And this then allows to... So what they did was compare this vision that they developed with a business-as-usual scenario, and it allow, allows to make specific recommendations again, which areas should be prioritized for... for forest uh, for, for protection or for restoration or where could you actually allocate forest concessions with least damage on overall, overall um, ecosystem services. And with this spatial distribution, of course, you can also then highlight where are the communities living, where do you have high incidence of poverty, so which are the areas you want to focus on. Um, with regard to which types of services and, and instruments. Okay, any questions regarding this one? Yeah. That seems like really detailed information. How do, do you know, do you use remote sensing to get the baseline data, or how do you get the data for this? Yeah, well, the... the, 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 the yeah, the system is quite interesting because you... They, I think they provide some ground level of data from worldwide sources, but you can, you can according to your data availability, enter all kinds of other data that you have available. And many countries do have remote sensing, or I mean, that's also something that has happened tremendously over the last 20 years, even in many developing countries, to, to compile it, this type of information to an extent that you, you have quite a bit of it around, but it's not that easy to make it actually useful for planning because it's hard to combine. It, it implies a lot of management of the data. And is, is this available public in sense? Uh, has have Gretchen Bailey and the others were involved in this made it? Yeah, you can access it on the internet and download it and run it on your that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. own computer. Yeah. Pablo? So, so uh, index allows you, could allow you to, for example, overlap uh, Yeah, I would say yes, but I have to admit that I, I don't really know the details. I just more or less believe what they told me it can do. But you should be, discuss this with uh, Rosemary when she comes, because she's really an expert on these, de these models and on other systems they are developing, because one of the um, big drawbacks of this is that it's not a dynamic model. I, I think that's a very good suggestion. I think those people who are involved with the Indonesian projects on, on in terms of wildlife and so on should definitely connect with Rosemary on the 3rd of November. Um, she's here lecturing at that time. And trying yeah. To catch yeah. Sorry, so has, has anyone of you actually logged in and checked out the software for your projects, Indonesian projects? Strongly recommend it. Yeah. In general, I don't know how many of you have actually had a D2 report in their hands or have looked through it. At the end of each chapter, there's the section on for further information, which has what we kind of could get our hands on with regard to easily accessible manuals, tools, databases, software, whatever. And it also has an annex where some of these tools are, and they're all described with one or two sentences what 
what their basic idea is and just go and, and check it out. And I know there's much more available. We've tried to update a little bit. If you come across something that's not in the report yet, please let me know as soon as possible. We're right in the middle of copy editing so we can include that as well. Okay. You don't know the tree calculator? You can go to this web. Can I click on it here? Can I go onto the internet? Oops, Let's see what happens. So, enter your zip code. Where are we here? Zero six five one. Another one. So, what kind of a tree would you like to know about? Red oak. Which oak? Sorry. Red oak. Red oak. Red oak. Oak. How about scarlet? Is that red enough? What diameter of tree? Okay, I'm going to put something. Okay, well, it takes from 0 to 45, but let's put 18 as something more realistic. And what kind of area are we looking at? Single family, multifamily, small commercial business, industrial or park or other vacant land? So here you get your values. <laughs> what, what are the assumptions here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it says somewhere. We've I've actually had a, a, a student do a a work on the application of some of these tools, and he did a couple of interviews. Does this only work in the US? Or is this, this, is wor this works for the US. There are some similar things in, in, in other countries, but this is the most comprehensive one, definitely. What is nice is that it has these different value categories, and again, we can then see, okay, for whom is this important? Here, obviously, an important part is property value, so a private benefit. But we have the storm water, which is interesting, beyond the, the, the private benefit. And we also have air quality, CO2, natural gas, whatever natural gas stands for. So. OK, how do I get back to my presentation? Yeah, there we are. So the city green is another interesting one, quite similar, a little bit more um, integrated, not, not entirely looking at a single tree, but more at, at different settings. But, so there's, there's plenty of software and possibilities to get value estimates on different functions. OK, now, page down. Potentials and challenges of arguing with ecosystem services in planning. So this is the point I made earlier in response to Pavlo. It is an opportunity to really look and do a forward-looking planning and not only place restrictions. And that also means you can focus on issues that people are much can relate to much easier than for example, biodiversity conservation, which for many people in many places remains very abstract. But when you start breaking this down into some services that might have biodiversity as a co-benefit, then it's easier to communicate and, and operate with. Now, accounting frameworks need regular updates, and that is, of course, a challenge and quite an input that you have to make into a process. It's it's therefore decisive that you set easily 
understandable, reliable ind indicators, but also easily accessible indicators. So it makes a lot of sense to actually work with the people in the municipality and look at what types of indicators do they already have, what are they already reporting on, will these serve as proxies for, for ecosystem services or what will be needed to complement this. And I mean, we, we looked at that with the, with the Philippines case, the Tubata case, if you, a large challenge is this invisibility of the values of the things happening. And if you can find indicators that allow you to communicate easily, that you, you've already won quite a, quite a ways. And one interesting example was from a payment for ecosystem service watershed uh, example in Peru, where, well, uh, colibacteria were one of the main water quality issues due to livestock and maybe even also humans being too close to the, to the river. So it was something that was very easily measurable. They could very clearly and quickly show this is improving. And that, of course, gets much more attention. And then uh, uh, people are much more willing to actually enter into negotiations for a payment scheme. Um, in terms of data collection, is there a role, or has there been a role for sort of uh, citizen science and sort of collection at a local level of data? Um, is that something that you both as a way to sort of diffuse the cost to sort of a centralized government or municipality um, and collect the data and also maybe generate different variables, different sort of uh, you know, metrics that you might want to sort of from the ground up? Does that happen to occur? Are there barriers that are yeah. up? Yeah, well, well, there are plenty of, of examples of, of cities trying to improve their, their indicator systems, especially also for environmental issues. If you look in, into a lot of the lo local Agenda 21 processes, they have some kind of component of, of this sort where, yeah, you have different agencies, but also NGOs or citizens getting to, together. And especially in biodiversity conservation, it, I mean, amateur naturalists are a very important source of, of information, of data collecting. And, and upkeeping. And within the Helmholtz Association, which is the research association I, we belong to, they have developed a sustainability approach that is kind of where they formulate some general rules and, and areas. And it's designed to then, with the community or with the municipality, select problem areas in the municipality and then lead them through a process of indicator selection based on what they have and what is readily available towards what, what might serve there. So there's, there's plenty of experience of yeah, trying to translate this down into something that is manageable and that can be up, kept up over time and that, that actually talks to people um, in this regard. Now, close this again. Now, the same is also valid with regard to, to values, monetary values and valuation. It's pretty difficult to make the case more than once using the same value. And therefore, it's, it, when, you, when you start some kind of assessment, be it sectoral, be it local, whatever, it's important that you, that you conceptualize it in such a way that key values can then easily be updated later on. Like the Cape Town study with regard to recreation was able to recur to, to earlier estimates and then just adjust for a number of people or adjust for certain changes so that they could use this. And as I've tried to highlight, the, the important point is we need political opportunities, and, but whenever they arise, we should be able to readily provide the, the necessary information and data and therefore keeping this kind of a more pragmatic approach in mind pays off in the, in the long term. So then I'd like to finish up with two slides of more or less conclusions from, from the team D2 overall where yeah, these are also our key messages and we're very proud that the, the ones in bold is the executive summary so that we've actually managed to, to
get them into a small into a small slogan we we think and i think yeah from all looking at all the different cases and and experiences that we've analyzed that definitely there is room to maneuver and that recognizing ecosystem services by going through the entire list is an important first step to create the awareness and then the conditions to make natural capital work for local development and human well-being. We're actually missing the capital in there. No. <laughs> not that I'm aware of, but they might not have read it. The Spanish translation is not on the web yet. <laughs> We think it's decisive to adapt appraisal design to your specific needs. And that's what you're supposed to do in your project. So that's a very important work before you get down to the actual valuation. But in order to get useful results, and I think that's, that's an important message to convey to policymakers, they need to understand and be involved in deciding on what is actually being measured, valued, and how, because otherwise these values are just figures and they might impress them for a moment, but they won't really talk to them. And I think that's an important lesson, for example, from the Cape Town study, but there are plenty more. It's important to find the right place for your results in decision making. So to quote one of Pavan's favorite sentences, if economics is weaponry, then paying attention to rights, and I mean property rights in the broad sense that we discussed last time, knowledge, so relating to local knowledge and, and um, experience, like for example in the Tanzania case, and participation of communities, but also of local administration, of, if you can get line managers, wonderful, otherwise opt for the people who directly work for them, and that, that will help against backfiring. We think it's decisive to build on the full range of values. There is a huge danger, and that's, that's happening in many places, that single services are promoted, are developed at the expense of others, and at the risk of degra degrading the entire system. That doesn't mean you need to calculate all the values. I'm very much in favor of prioritizing and selecting the, the ones that are decisive to your decision problem. But I think it's important to look at all of them and communicate the importance of all of them. Yeah, and then we also strongly believe that it's better to err on the side of caution definitely these services and these values don't tell you something on system functioning or on thresholds or potential damage costs. So you need complementary estimates and expertise to get a grip on that. And if in doubt, better stay on the conservative side. The way forward, well, we think there is quite a role of communicating ecosystem services and their values in whatever format to make the case, to get clarity on trade-offs in decisions. So location of projects might be decisive, specific design of a conservation measure of, or of whatever other measure is, can be decisive. and looking into who is affected by your decision is, is decisive there as well. You have quite a potential to increase efficiency of, of public sector in, in general, regarding many areas. In, in the ICLE workshop in South Africa, we did an exercise in the, we had a workshop and we asked, uh, yeah, people from African municipalities to, to rank the five most important issues in, in their municipality. And it, I'd say in 80% of cases, they were in one way or other related to ecosystem services or ecosystem services improvement could contribute to resolving them. Yeah, and then 
obviously explain, explore win-win options. Okay, with this I'm done with my lecture and open for any further questions and discussions. <laughs>